and welcome to uh, So as Evelina said, it will be, there are three of us, uh, me, Marislava, those who don't know me, but I guess everyone knows, and after me, uh, Lee, uh, Alice and Lise will also continue to give short presentations, and then we will have some hands-on session. So basically we will have as I just mentioned, we will have three short presentations to give you an overview about three different products. And at the end, we will have a hands-on session on visual interpretation of the maps, based the maps that we, pre we will present right now. So I will start with, I will, I'm starting with, um, I will share some experience with you about the um, Mapping global uh, mapping forest management globally. This is our experience together in collaboration with Vito. So to give you a little bit of background, uh, so land use becoming more and more critical for policymakers, more 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 critical than land cover information, and it's with obviously desperate need by many applications. And unfortunately, up to now, there are still not enough of information. There is there are little. Not that many global land use maps available of sufficient quality, and what is out there is usually outdated, not complete, and very often we are not aware how accurate it is actually. And on this background, we started our work. We started in far 2017. That was our past work where we developed the first version of global forest management map. At that moment of time, it was for the year 2015 at 100 meter resolution. We used the legend, which was based on FAO forest categories. So it was very closely aligned with FAO definitions with additional classes on agroforestry, uh, on agroforestry and oil palm plantations. As input data, at that moment of time, we used probably at 100 meter resolution. And we also use training and validation data sets that were collected. First, we started with the crowdsourcing campaign, and then actually we learned that it was the task was a bit too difficult for the general crowd. That's why we, since then, we focus more, we involve, we rely more on expert opinion or, re, or on regional knowledge. Um, so the methodology by the time we run uh, models per biome and we run random forest. And now we got a nice opportunity, thanks to WR, we got an opportunity to continue this work. And we are working on developing a new version of the map. It's also gonna be at 100 meter resolution because this is a good compromise from user perspective. And it's gonna be for the year 2020. We will have more classes in, to com in comparison with our older map. So we will have now also rubber plantations as a separate class and also fruit tree plantations to be more encompassed with UDR guidelines. And as input data, we use Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. And we are also working on a new training data sets. So we are, we, are, um, we, are, we are revising the old training data sets. And methodologically speaking, we are also now testing various mo models, including cut boosts. So from talking about classifications, this is mainly done by our partners, Vito. And at this moment of time, um, we are testing various models, Sentinel-1 model, Sentinel-2 combined models. And we are testing also some global model versus models, regional mod versus regional models. Also, there are some experience ongoing which features to use, and especially if we, Sentinel data is a 10 meter resolution. So how, what are the best way to aggregate this information to 100 meter? And here at Yaza in parallel, in parallel, because those experience are mainly done with still with the old data, here in parallel at Yaza, we are collecting, uh, we are revising the old training data set for the year 2020. So we have already done already checks for the change, uh, revised location where change happened between 2015 and the year 2020. We have been also revising training data to separate, to delineate these two additional classes, rubber and fruit tree plantations. And now we are in process, we are starting this process to collect more training data in the areas of low accuracy, where basically we receive the feedback that our old map was not good. For this, we use our GeoWiki tool. And um, you can see this is an example how our main interface looks. 
and we use various sources of information, very high resolution images, but we also use uh, rely a lot on Sentinel-2 time series to understand a little bit dynamics and history of each location. Uh, we use a lot of picture, Google Street View e images, and so on. And uh, now I would like to give you a few examples. So usually now when we uh, collect or revise training data, we start from the point we know that in this region we expect to have some uh, intact forests, forests with low human impact. Then we go on Wiki, we still check it, this area. We check this all surrounding areas. It depends on the region. If it's um, in some places, a good indicator is if it's a mixed forest, it means most likely it's not managed. And based on this, we assign to polygons set in classes. The same we do for man managed forests. For managed forests, like the majority of cases, you can see signs of clear cards nearby. You can see signs of singing. And so, for example, the forest, which is at the bottom, um, it's most likely planted forest. And to give you a few other examples, this example of woody plantations, for example, but this is something um, with quite some training and having uh, some uh, on-ground observations, uh, you learn how actually the woody plantation, intense woody plantation like pine uh, or some other poplar or how they look. And then you basically, based on this, you can already, uh, after some training, you can say, what is it exactly? And the same about rubber plantation. So you need a little bit of training to look in different images. And then you basically, after some training, you will recognize this is actually rubber. This is not teak or this is not pine. Uh, fruit plantations are usually a little bit more easier, <laughs> be, uh, easier, and also agroforestry. Well, it depends, but usually if it's a simple case, like in this case when you have cropland and pasture fields, and on top some fruit trees, so this is th that's usually uh, that's going to be a case of agroforestry on our map. Um, yeah, I will. We will have a bit more examples during our hands-on session, but I will wrap up here and just to give you some. Um, final remarks. So basically, we expect that somewhere in May 2025, we will have a new updated version of the forest management layer. Uh, we, as usual, as we did it with our first work, we will make everything public and open access. Uh, and mo we, moreover, we have in plans to have some extensive, exhaustive independent validation, but this will be done by the end of 2025. This will require a bit more time. And uh, so now, so yeah, and at the end of, two, after two more presentations, we will have our hands-on session. Uh, but unfortunately, this workshop is quite short. So those who would like to be more, would like to continue or con to participate in the continuation and to get more information of this work, you can write down your email address and your name. So I have prepared two pieces of paper. Yes, <laughs> so we can maybe distribute it. So if you are interested in a follow-up workshop, which will be obviously online, so you can write down your mail and we can contact you and organize something in two or three weeks from now. Thank you. If there are some questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you would have this global management map, forest management map, uh, May 2025. Will it also be released during that same time or the release is only later scheduled? Uh, so I think it's more as a release day because, I mean, contractually speaking, it should be done, prepared earlier. <laughs> I think we have some other obligation by April, if I'm not mistaken, something like this. So yeah, so, and then after the review, yes, we can publish it, yeah. So that's why I mentioned May. So that's that's more or less a bit, yeah. Maybe just a question, Miroslava, to our colleagues from WRI. Is the plan then to put this layer when it's completed on uh, Global Forest Watch on online? So, yeah, I can put it on the platform. But we're going to discuss this layer feed and do a number of other products which are on. Right, right. Yeah, it would be excellent, though, to have it as a, as a separate layer, I think, because there's a lot of interest in this. So. Yeah, it would be great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Liz Goldman, Research Manager for Global Forest Watch. Those who saw my talk yesterday um, heard kind of big picture strategy of Global Forest Watch. And now I'm going to zoom into one data set that we have on, on Global Forest Watch and get um, a little bit more in the weeds detailed. So this is the spatial database of planted trees. And just to give a little bit of background about why we're interested in, in planted trees. Um, as we've discussed throughout the conference, it's come up a few different times. Tree cover is not forest, right? And it's certainly not natural forest. And when Global Forest Watch first launched, we found that our users were getting a little confused. You know, with pink pixels of loss were, were popping up in tree plantation areas, rotations for timber, for old oil palm trees that were being cut down. And it was hard to focus in on loss that mattered. And so to help with this, we set about creating a database of planted trees. And if I can do this for just a minute, get, get into the definitions space, just so that we're all on the same page about what these different terms mean. Um, this is sort of how Global Forest Watch thinks about this, but these are of course informed by FAO and the Accountability Framework Initiative and other work. But um, when we're talking about tree cover, Usually the way we're thinking about it, the way our data sets map it is woody vegetation that meets a certain height and or tree canopy density level. And a lot of data sets, you know, you can vary what height and tree canopy density level you want to select. When you go into forests, um, typically that might include natural and planted forest. The planted part is controversial, I think, but for FAO purposes, they include planted forests. Um, I think most people agree it excludes tree crops. And sometimes there's minimum area requirements like FAO has 0 0.5 hectares. Um, there's sometimes height and canopy density level requirements. And then there's sometimes land use and in-situ requirements too. Um, I'm not putting the FAO definition here specifically just because countries also have forest area definitions, might be three meters in height, it might be five or, and same with um, tree canopy density levels vary depending on the, the country. Um, natural forest typically excludes planted trees. Um, these are areas that are absent major human impacts. They can include managed and degraded forests. This is very much an AFI informed definition. And then finally, planted trees, this general term that we use for the database. We think of that as including planted forests, like for timber production and that sort of thing, and then tree crops orchards, citrus trees, oil palm, that sort of thing. And so with that in mind, the goal of this project was to separate natural forests from planted trees with the goal of eventually mapping, better mapping where natural forest exists, um, which is why we created the spatial database of planted trees. Now, what is this? Um, it's basically a, um, a combination of data sets on planted forests and tree crops all combined into a database. And the work, the, a large part of the work has been on finding that information through literature review, um, through mining, you know, country maps, old um, web websites with, um, you know, land cover maps that countries might host through partnering with other research organizations to produce new data. Um, and then harmonizing this information into a single attribute table so that the data kind of works together so that we don't have one data set referring to planted trees by its species name and another one referring to it by a common name. And there's no way of like searching across the different data sets. Um, version one was launched in 2019. And earlier this year, we published version 2.0. So there's technical documentation online for this updated data set, we plan to put it on Global Forest Watch by the end of this year and also have the data for um, download as well. And I don't think the link is up just yet, but if anyone wants the actual data, just reach out to me and I'm happy to send it. Um, for those of you who are familiar with version one of the database, this is just a bit of information about how it's been updated. So the data in version two is closer um, aligned to 2020 than in the past. We now have coverage for 158 countries um, in large part due to the data that Miroslava presented on already. And then we made a, a big effort to try to find additional sources with um, species level information as well. 
And I should say too, that it's not just that we expanded the coverage of countries, but we also updated some of the original countries that were present in the version one database. Um, so with these improvements, um, or rather new, new data sources that we've added, we found that the data reaches near global coverage, about 90% of the planted forest area as reported to FRA in 2020 is represented in the, in the spatial database of planted trees. And we also have a few new attribute um, information as well. We can, you can look at um, the, the latest year of planting information. So when, when the plantations were last established or, or replanted, and then we also have carbon removal factors that were added to all the new sources as well. And I'm happy to say that our sort of initial dream of having this help delineate natural forests has come true. And Elise is gonna talk about that next, but we have seen the database play a key part in delineating natural forests through our work with SBTN. And we also see ARC creating their forest extent map with the spatial database of planted trees. Um, the data set has also kind of taken a life of its own too. So it's not just um, kind of a means to an end. We see that um, certain um, groups are using it for um, actual law enforcement, expediting timber shipments. The APHIS group in the US is using it for Lacey Act compliance. Um, and then also carbon researchers are using it for carbon sequestration rates for their work as well. And then quickly, just future plans. So we do want to keep the database up to date. Um, version 2.1 is actually gonna be out soon. We're trying to make um, faster updates as new data sets come out. We have another four countries worth of information that we've added with 2.1, focusing on agroforestry systems that we're missing from the database. And we are working to incorporate a likely species attribute as part of a three-point zero update in 2025, also including um, Canada, Brazil, and a few other countries that we're targeting for better um, planted tree information. We have likely species as well, which I can talk a little bit about in the, in the questions or after if anyone's interested, but basically there's a lot of information out there that's not at the polygon level, but might be at a province level or an administrative two level saying, these are the types of plantations that are typically found in this location. And so focusing in on the um, two thirds of the database that don't have any species information, trying to link that you know, non-polygon information to the database where possible. And um, yeah, that's, that's it, but happy to answer any questions about the database if there's any. Maybe maybe just a quick clarification. So it's kind of a, a real mixture of of data sources essentially that you've pulled together to to develop this, right? So you, you mentioned maps. You were sort of like scraping, basically, right? Uh, yeah, most of it is um, publicly available data sets that are that you can download. Okay. Um, but yes, um, so for the most part, we're not scraping data off of websites. Okay. Um, but yes, it's it's some peer-reviewed peer data sources. Some of it are from country websites, um, okay. ministry websites. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, do you have an idea how is this map consistent with, uh, to what extent is it consistent with the other layers you have on on, on your portal? Uh, like, for example, Hanson's, uh, Hanson's uh, layer. I mean, how many grids that are in the three, three law, three cover loss data set are potentially covered or not covered by by this product? Yeah, so I I consider this to be a subset of his tree cover data set. Um, there's some places where the polygon information for planted trees was hand delineated and it actually captured unstocked areas that wouldn't have been picked up in a remote sensing product. So those would kind of fall out of his tree cover um, mask that's that's on Global Forest Watch. When we've looked at um, the loss within planted trees across the tropics, it's about 3% of tree cover loss falls within planted forests. But of course, once you get into certain regions, it's a lot higher. Like if we're talking about Southern Brazil, a higher percentage of the tree cover loss down there would be planted in planted 
um, eucalyptus or other types of plantations down there. But across the tropic, it's about 3%. And uh, I'm wondering uh, if the second version will be in the same uh, polygon vector format. Uh, Say that again, sorry. Uh, first version was uh, in uh, in this shape file with polygons and uh, vector format. It's uh, second version will be in the same uh, format. Yes, we yes, exactly. We maintain a vector database. Mm -hmm. We are thinking about making raster versions of the data available since that's just a lot easier for certain users. Um, in their workflow, but yeah, so hopefully we can make the raster a raster version available too. Mm -hmm. sure. Sure. Thanks. So just to follow up on that, so was it then that you had some raster data and you made then polygons out of it, or was all data, all data polygon data? Yeah, some some of the data in it are vectorized raster data sets. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Elise Mazur. I work with Liz at the World Resources Institute. Um, I don't work on Global Forest Watch, but I do work on Land and Carbon Lab, where we're trying to go beyond just forests uh, to all land cover. Um, and we're, I mean, I'll talk today about how we're building off of the two data sets that Miroslav and Liz just talked about um, to map natural lands um, across the world. Um, I work on this largely with a coworker, Michelle Sims, but also with a lot of help from Liz and other folks at WRI. Okay, quickly, um, why do we map natural lands? What is natural and how do we map it? Um, so as we all know, we're losing natural forests, grasslands and savannas at unprecedented levels. And a lot of this is due to agricultural expansion. Um, and so we wanna work with companies who have a lot of power in agricultural lands to do, uh, try their best to cut back on sourcing from farms that are uh, clearing forests and savannas and other natural ecosystems. Um, so we work with the Science-Based Targets Network, which is different from the Science-Based Target Initiative that you may know that has voluntary corporate targets. Um, the initiative has targets for emissions and the network has targets for nature. Um, and they have freshwater targets and uh, land targets. And we're just gonna talk about one of the land targets, which is the first one, which is no conversion of natural ecosystems. Um, there's also other targets to help companies reduce their overall footprint and engage in local initiatives uh, to protect and restore land. So the goal of this first target is for companies to have zero deforestation or conversion of natural ecosystems in their supply chains since 2020. So similar cutoff date to um, the UDR, but this goes beyond forests, all land cover, um, earlier if you already have, a, or if a company already has a previous deforestation free commitment. So the challenge here is that companies need, largely need two pieces of information. One is what was natural in 2020, and also where they have sourced their products from, and we're gonna address uh, the first challenge here. Um, our solution is to make a data product that helps companies set a baseline uh, for measuring deforestation and conversion like from in 2020, um, which creates a new challenge of how do we do that? Uh, you can see a sneak peek of the map here, um, but let's start with what are natural lands. So uh, Liz just started to address this, um, but basically a natural ecosystem is one that substantially resembles what would be found in a given area in the absence of major human impacts from the uh, species composition structure and ecological function perspective. Not all of that is mappable um, from space, but uh, it's where we started. Um, to add to that, they have a forest definition very similar to the FAO definition. And so if you combine the two, you get a natural forest. Um, and just a note, sorry, I should have cleaned up some of the text on here, but um, if there are local definitions that are different, um, those are acceptable as well. 
all of these definitions that I'm showing are in the technical note that we wrote, which I linked to at the end in case you wanna read on further. Um, but when we go beyond forests, we are non-forest ecosystems, um, largely follow the same theme. They are either pristine or they can also be regenerated, managed, um, or partially degraded. Uh, so we're kind of talking like natural and semi-natural or like low intensity management. Okay, how did we do it? Which is the, the big question. Uh, so this um, follows a similar kind of decision tree as to something we saw yesterday that was presented where um, we essentially overlay a bunch of different data sets and we say, okay, we'll start with the UMD uh, forest height data and say, if it's above five meters, um, then we move on to, is it intact? And if it is, then we check for, we apply a minimum mapping unit of half a hectare. And then if it falls within all of those, then it's a natural tree cover um, or a natural forest. Um, but if it's not intact and it falls within the spatial database of planted trees that Liz just presented, then it's non-natural tree cover. Um, if it's neither, but it is cropland or built up, we send it to those classes. Um, and if it's none of those, so it is, but it is tree cover and it's over half hectare, it's also natural. Um, we also have a bunch of regional data sets that I'll talk about in a minute that we incorporate. And when we reclassify those, um, if those are reclassified as natural, then it replaces the global data. Um, I have here our full, well, this is half of our, our full workflow uh, diagram for all of our land covers. Um, again, this is in our technical note, but just generally to summarize, we take um, UMD global land cover data, ESA world cover data, assume it's natural unless it overlays with one of these purple data sets um, where we say, okay, if it overlays with overlays with one of these, then it's not natural. We also then apply minimum mapping units, wetland uh, reclassifications, peat reclassifications, and then we take in our regional data and completely replace the global data um, where we have regional data. Um, okay, I keep talking about regional data. What do I mean? Um, so here you can see a map of regional data. Um, the dark gray areas are where we took an entire land cover map, reclassified it, and replaced the global data. The like hash mark areas are where we had a single class. So like um, in Africa, we had digital earth Africa cropland data. So we added that to the map to say, okay, this is where cropland um, exist. Um, in the US, um, we used the national land cover data set, but we only took a few classes that we knew we needed in, like an um, increased confidence in, like pasture and hay. And so we took that single class um, plus a few others <laughs> and, and replaced the global data um, and so on. And in, in Europe, we use uh, Korean data, but we just took the natural grassland classes. Um, again, you can see the full list here or in our tech note. Um, so I mentioned the definition that we started with, and then we kind of ended with this more operational definition of what's mappable. Um, here is just our natural forest definition, but again, we have this for all land cover. Um, and you can see here just the natural forest classes um, that you'll be able to see um, in the interactive part after this presentation as well. And um, most importantly, uh, we had a Miroslava lead a validation campaign um, collecting almost 5,000 points um, to validate the binary natural and non-natural. Uh, you can see our confusion matrix here and coming soon is validation of just the natural forest class itself um, since folks are interested in using it for the UDR. Um, that's it. And you can see here, um, if you go to this QR code, it brings you to our Earth Engine app where you can explore the data, but also it has links to the tech note um, and our GitHub. Thanks. Any questions off the bat? Also happy to answer as you're like exploring the map and you're like, why does it look this way? Cool, should we start the interactive yeah, part? I guess it's a very new product, the National Forest Map. So yeah. was it oh, already published? I should say. Yeah. <laughs> so it was not yet. We published a beta version last year, but the version one came out a few weeks ago. 
uh, and it, it's available at that link. <laughs> if if you uh, allow me, just just one more question. Um, th this is great. Um, I'm just wondering to what degree. Yeah, maybe you can hear me or can uh, okay. okay, so um. Um, this this relates now a bit to um, other potential laws which are coming besides the UDR. The, the commission is thinking about expanding from forests to other wooded land. And I'm just wondering, because you have looked at a lot of these um, national data sets, to what degree you, because it's it's very useful, but if the commission now decides to expand, though they will probably not go into all other natural land, they will go into other wooded land and potentially also into grassland. So these two other classes are currently under discussion. There is a company which you know, I think you have had some, Lindsay, I think had some interaction, tri trigonometrics or something, trigon, I don't, you know the name? The, the, yeah. Tri anyway, they, they have this task now to basically define. Sorry, it's because I have to switch off then. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. So, so that is a little bit now the question to what degree can you tease out on this current natural land map these other, other classes? Because that's partly their job they are doing. So, it would be very interesting to then also compare. Um, yeah, just just a thought. While while Miroslava has been uploading, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, just really quickly to respond. Um, the map is a binary, but then we also have all the land cover classes below it. But to your point, we have forests, and then we have short vegetation, which catches the other woodlands, all the grasslands, savannas, kind of everything else. Um, and I I haven't seen. I, I think in our local data there are some good um, data sets that do separate those out, but we've found that a lot of the local data also combines them. So we've had to even split out um, savannas into yeah, wooded lands or to forests and to other short vegetation. So I think that other wooded lands is still lacking a little bit. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering in this, uh, this layer, because it's binary, um, what happens exactly with like semi-natural vegetated lands? Because I feel like in my experience, very often you have that sort of intermediate cover and, and, and uh, yeah, I was just curious how you deal with that there in the workflow. Yeah, great question. So in our definition of natural, we um, try to include like those semi-natural low intensity usage or management managed lands um, because we would rather be err on the side of caution by calling them natural um, opposed to calling them not natural since companies are using this to say, have I converted land? And so we'd rather protect that semi-natural as natural, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so often, so I think the answer to your question is that all of that semi-natural land should be going to the natural class, but it's based on the data that's available. So like cropland is all not natural if it's been mapped. So, uh, so the product is really intended to be for companies then in a way, because I guess like if you're like a policymaker in a government, you, you'd have different objectives and... Yeah. Yeah, we have one main use case that was developed for the corporate target setting so that, yeah, the companies are the main audience. So yeah, definitely use caution if you're a government government making policy decisions with it. Thank you for the questions. And now uh, we have a little bit of time left, 20 minutes, and let's move on to our hands-on session. Uh, to actively participate in this session, we will kindly ask you to 
uh, log in into a wiki. If not, you can, you can for example, um, search for our page, GeoWiki.org. You will have, I don't know if you are registered or not, but you will have to create an account or you can also try it as a guest. So once you are on GeoWiki, once you have registered, for example, here I have registered already, Usually, always you will have um, a number. I don't remember what is the landing place. Maybe it's by the fallen cover because we have different branches of GeoWiki, different pages with different information, and you can explore what is there. But for this particular session, we have prepared one a page which is called Feedback Global Forest Watch, and usually on the left. Uh, left uh, upper corner, you can select among the list of offer different branches. You can go and select feedback, global forest watch, um, GeoWiki. And here for now, we have put uploaded so this is of open access so everyone who registered can access this page. And here we have uploaded for our session two maps the old version of the global forest management layer. And also the natural forest, the first version of natural forest presented by Alice. Um, so a little bit about this page, just that you are, um, you know how to use it. So we have uh, different sections. So we will start a little bit explaining from the what we have on the left side. So we have different sections. The first one section maps. So there you can select the layers that you are interested in. You can select the option, don't show any overlays. Uh, you can play with transparency. And uh, then there is a geocodic section, but this is like somewhere you can provide your coordinates and you can jump to the location you are interested in and you want to check the map, for example, in that particular location. And we have the last section is actually the feedback. It was developed to collect feedback on the map where you will have at the first you decide, you select the map that you are interested in, for example, Global Forest Watch. And then you have you have show all show of my. This means you can uh, select one of these options, and the polygons feedback that was previously submitted will show up, and you can have a look at it. So you can check only your feedback that you have submitted, but you can also check the feedback by submitted by other people. As said, all this information is open. And then the next button start drawing. So this is when you are exactly uh, somewhere on the map. So you can draw polygons, select set an area, and and you can write your comment, and then you can actually submit your feedback. You can you you have also an option to submit your feedback without any geometry, and then you have two options. You can sub, actually also download your feedback. You can download like with spatial explicit information or with geometry or without geometry. You have different options. Uh, you have you can download only your feedback that you have been collecting, or you can download all the feedback that people provided on this map. So these are the tools. Another interesting tool that I, I kept a little bit at the end, there are these. And this is a tool, the first one that you can see, this is NDVI time series. So um, show my screen cancel scratch I have to do so now when you use this tool you have to select NDI vegetation profile and you go wherever you want on the map and once you click you will get some NDI information derived from various remote sensing products so this is something that can help you while you're doing visual interpretation so you have from derived from Landsat, MODIS, ProboV, yeah, and depending on duration, so you can see you can, you have can have these various profiles. Then the next one, which we are actually using a lot, so uh, to close it, you have to press total and divide overlay. And the next tool, which we have been using quite a lot, because the problem when you do such a visual interpretation, you don't know really the date of underlying images, and in some places it can be too old. And so in this cases, we use a lot Sentinel time series, Sentinel profiles, and like we click in any location, for example, here. 
you can have different composites and you have all the long time series started from 2015 up 2022, but we can extend always to up to 24. It depends which period we're interested in. And here you have detailed information what was more or less happening here. But I guess you have to get used to a little bit. Usually we use color infrared because you have much better contrast if you have fires, because when it's just natural color colors, sometimes you don't see very well. Yeah, because the contrast is very little in data. And you can even select, check it like here, you clearly see there are fires and you can get more detailed information checking when exactly, when was the first image where the fire was detected and it was like in uh, August. 2021. So this is additional some additional information that you can use. And then also on the here on the right, we have different very high resolution layers. We have Google, Bing, and S3. So usually what we experience, it depends where you are on the location, but in many cases, Google is up to date, but S3 is also very good and also has very recent images. And if you are, it depends where you are, but if you are somewhere far away in the north, um, Google S3 or Bing, they, they have better images than Google, for example. Very often, like in Google, you have nothing, very only Landsat images available, while S3 will have something at higher res. Um, okay, so this that was a short introduction. Uh, I said you can try it on your site. So, and now, like, I mean, now I am open to go to any place <laughs> in the at the globe and to check together with you one of the layers that we have. Let me first select, like, for example, global forest management layer. If you have any suggestion, we can go there. Yes. Sorry. Nature forest. Yeah. Two examples of problems, but not for natural forest. Just small areas. I just know one. Ah, nice. <laughs> um, but but I have to. So you submitted already the feedback, Linda, right? So. Yes. So I have to go to natural forest. To make show all. <laughs> Maybe it's, uh, but do you remember? So this is Madagascar. He, down. Oh, I see it. I see it. I see it. So, but uh, now I lost it. <laughs> but there was one. Um, where was it? Let me quickly. Ah, oh, yeah, it's here. So just, I should not lose it. It was somewhere here, right? Yes, it's here, next to the river. Yes, yes. Yes, here, yes. So now, for example, we can, as, yes, this I have to deactivate and see, yes, this is a description that should be cropland. And so far it was, um, let's see, it takes a bit of time before. Yeah, so this is a good example how you can use it, this feedback tool. And this is a very useful information at the end for us because we, all, we then we collect this feedback and we use it to improve the map in those places. Uh, thank you, Linda. <laughs> and anyone else? Oh, it's not necessary that you submitted something, but if you want to check right now, like in this live session, a certain location, just yeah, just let me know. Or I can decide by myself. <laughs> but for me, there is no big difference where to go. <laughs> We had to travel. <laughs> yeah. The non natural is really, really small. That, like less than half the size of a pixel. That's not feedback here in the screen, right? It should be larger than a pixel or? Uh, it depends. Uh, you mean a pixel, but pic pixel is very small, you know, it's just if it's centimeters. Yeah, it's centimeter, right? Yeah, so, but this area I think is bigger. I think it's a good feedback like this also to us, yeah. Also, if you know of a data set that has better cropland data in this area, we'd love to hear. Yeah. 
Um, I think the map is not showing. That's what I'm looking. We have now GeoWiki problem. The maps. One is it? Or maybe your RTS. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's try now. And it was about that. So how would you use this in the managing? Like, so say I was going to turn the polygon, on, you would just manually modify the map or you rerun the training? No, we, uh, we rerun the training on our side for this global forest management. We rerun the training, yeah. We run the training, and then it's a question also, Alice, because you can also use this information either for validation or deciding on which map to, yeah, to use, regional map to use. Yeah, and since the natural lands map is just a compilation of other data, we're not actually training a model. Yeah, if Miroslav re reruns global forest management, then that's great. Otherwise, we might use it to focus our search for new data. Yeah, so we see here it's all mapped as, yeah, it's natural. And that was a cropland, yes, cropland field. Yes, it's a cropland field. And if you if you go to, yeah, I think it's just a corner here. So you see it's a bit, <laughs> it's not exactly because I guess it's there is some natural secondary or woodlands are coming. It's degraded forest according to that. <laughs> so there are some, Natural regeneration is happening a little bit in this area. That's why it was classified as it's exactly it's a corner. But this is 100 meter resolution. So in fact, what you detect, it's much smaller. It's quite, yeah. So ideally, at this space, it would be interesting, in fact, a bit like if um, for bigger areas, when we have quite a, a more uh, feedback about something like big, and um, for example, for example, if we are in Africa, in Madagascar, because Madagascar is also interesting, even with these terms of natural vegetation, you see, for example, here we mapped, this is still some, some potential secondary vegetation, but not necessary, maybe those are actually banana trees. <laughs> so this is something that we will have to check and to validate still in this area, what is happening, if there is, in fact, this is degraded forest coming back or not. But it's definitely not primary forest anymore. This is degraded to recover. Um, then if, for example, like talking about Africa, uh, we kind of did a lot of efforts spent last time, like really to delineate agroforestry areas from forests. And you see in many places like here, so in some places map is still not good, but in some places like here, for example, you can see this old tree cover, but this old tree cover agroforestry areas. So, so it's almost like a fruit trees or this old heavy agricultural areas. And you can see, so this is in this area, we managed to um, delineate it not too badly over here. And then you have this more or less disturbed natural forest, but yeah, it's already. So maybe I am. Um, do you want me to have? Do you want to have a quick look at the legend so that you are not confused with the colors? Because I realize that ah, we have five minutes left. <laughs> uh, what can I say? So I can say that here, if you um, we have a legend, and on this map, so on my side, I'm a bit biased because I'm quite used already to the colors, but we have dark green, so it's a natural forest, not disturbed by humans. And uh, for example, dark, dark green will be these areas and wherever we were here, somewhere in Africa, there's already quite strong human impact, but it's still natural forest, that's why natural forest, but with human impact, clear signs of human impact are in this bright green. And then we have blue, this is replanted forests, and replanted forests were uh, with long rotation and it's quite a lot. We will have, for example, in the US, in Canada, you have planted a lot of planted forests and also in Europe, uh, like Sweden, um, Finland, for example, Norway, 
you will have Sweden, you will also have lots of this replanted forest category. Then we have also class plantation forest, including Kraba. And uh, yes, in, the, in that version of the map, in the new version, it is going to be separated. And this you will have only in more intensely managed areas, like you will have it to see in Asia, quite a lot of plantations, for example, in this area. You will have, but I think it's mainly most like going to be a rubber. Yes. Opa, you know, this is rubber. So, so mainly rubber plantations that you have here, which we are mapped as at that moment of time, because rubber plantations are part of wood plantation forest according to FIO, and we follow, followed FIO definition. Um, then we had oil palm, which is in purple, bright purple color, which, for example, you can see here. So in Asia, it's a small holder. All these oil palms, small holder farming. Yeah, a lot, a lot. Here is a mistake, it's a noise. Uh, then you have also agroforestry. As you understand, agroforestry we labeled in yellow. So I think a little bit, if you start working with a map, you get used to these colors and uh, then you are much faster in checking the quality. Uh, yeah, so this this is more or less. Um, unfortunately, this session is very short, so we don't have time to spend more and to look at more locations across the globe. But if you are really interested, we can have one more session online where for this you can subscribe, put your name on, and uh, we can organize something as a follow-up in two or three weeks from now. Uh, 